All right, good morning and welcome to Web3 Wednesdays, where we chat through some of the complex and nuanced topics in crypto and Web3 at large so that you can stay ahead of the curve. So today I'm joined by John Linden, CEO of Mythical Games, a game company focused on building player-owned economies by incorporating certain emerging technologies. Mythical made a big splash on the scene with its launch of Blankos, arguably one of the most casual-friendly introductions to the power of user-owned digital assets. So prior to Mythical, John was also studio head at Activision Blizzard on both the Call of Duty and Skylanders franchises. John's deep experience across both Web2 and Web3 gaming and fresh success in deploying some of these certain blockchain technologies to the benefit of the players make him a fantastic resource for digging in around the complexities of game economies and user ownerships. So we're excited to hear his insight. So John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sam. What an intro, man. That's that's great. So I'm glad oh, to be here. Excellent. Well, we're happy to have you. So I want to focus our chat today, you know, around two big topics in the space. So one is the importance of digital ownership, you know, real user ownership of digital assets and the implications that go with that. And then the second is, you know, the economic balancing considerations in the context of Web3 gaming um, and kind of the difficulties that the industry is facing right now. So, you know, just broadly speaking, Mythical, you guys have already had really solid success in the space. Can you share any key takeaways that you guys found when you were deploying Blancos as a user owned economy? <laughs> um... Yeah, well, how long we got here? I could, I could go all day on that. Um, you know, I think what's really interesting, Sam, is like so we come from we've come from this you know kind of traditional gaming space, and and so we've seen a lot, you know. And I think our team we've had a lot of experience in PC and console. We've seen a lot in mobile, and I think we're in a really interesting position to kind of bring this tech into into these games. Um, but I think what we've even seen is obviously the difference between how you bring out a PC mobile ga game, what the demographics are, what are they looking for, is very different than mobile, right? So I think what's what's kind of fascinating is we think this Web three is really a paradigm shift rather than a platform shift. But there's learnings that frankly apply to both, right? That we're, we're, we've been kind of kind of looking at. So one of the things we did when we started Mythical is we said, hey, we want a game. Let's actually have a game that from the ground up is really built around these concepts. And frankly, it's ours to kind of mess up or do right, you know? And, and we, we have an ab ability to experiment and really understand what these levers are. So I think that, that's been really exciting. You know, we have a million and a half accounts in Blanco's. You know, it's coming to Epic Game Store now, which is exciting. Which Very we, you impressive. Know, we think yeah, that could drop another, you know, that could drop quite a few million players in the game if it goes well. So, so you know, we, we've seen a lot there. And I think the other thing we actually have done with Blancos is we've stayed very focused on digital assets, right? And there's kind of a reason we've done that. We haven't put a big Blancos token in there. Um, to be super honest, I think that, that there's there's kind of, there's really two sides, and I, I'm not sure which side you want to go down first, but like the digital asset side, there's a lot of lessons and learnings there alone. The token side is a is kind of its own fickle beast a little bit, and we've actually kind of stayed away from that, primarily initially because one, it's actually really difficult to balance a game with yeah. a stable virtual uh, currency, right? Um, and we've had a lot of experience doing that, but we can get that wrong, right? So let alone having kind of an external currency that's fluctuating by the second um, makes that very difficult. But more importantly. For us, it's about on the token side, it's really about longevity, right? The reason the US dollar can last is because 100 years from now, people are going to still use the US dollar, right? There, there's, there's a long reason to use that. And frankly, um, you know, groups like the United States government, they're backed up by a military, they're backed up by oil reserves, right? There's a lot of things that they can do to ensure that value of that, of that, of that dollar stays at least somewhat stable. Um, I think gaming is a little harder to do that, right? Um, if you suddenly have a game that only lasts three months and then you start falling off on, on your user base, you, naturally that value is going to diminish, right? Uh, so it's really, we've been kind of staying away from that right now. We are going to be exploring some concepts. I will be, it won't be a token traded on Binance for a new game, but there will be some concepts of a, of a, of a tokenized uh, currency, but a little bit different than like what Axie's done with SLP and stuff like that. So I love it. That's kind of what we're doing on that side. We, we've really kind of avoided tokens by design we really focus on the digital assets. Yeah, and I've written about this before, but you know, introducing tokens, NFTs, sometimes multiple tokens, it, it, it sends a really complicated message, not only to users, but also to investors. Uh, and when you enter into this kind of Web3 age, because your assets become investable, either collectibles or actual currencies, you, you have to you know, consistently message across all of your different groups. So I, I think that the approach that you guys have taken, it's novel in the space right now, and it definitely has a ton of merit. Um, and you know, kind of digging in on, on these you know, truly owned digital assets, uh, and this is kind of a user-friendly question, but when people hear that, right, they, 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 they tend to think that's a whole lot of nonsense. Like, what does that even mean, a truly owned digital yeah. asset? So, what is, you know, how do you guys message that to people? How do you educate at the same time? 
Yeah, and I, I think that that's a great point. I think there's a lot of misnomers out there, and and frankly, there's a lot. There's always going to be different forms of ownership, right? And and honestly, ownership could also lead into a security if you're not careful, right? So there's a lot of design around what does that mean, and what does that mean for that particular application. You know, groups like Yuga, they've actually done some really fascinating experiments to where it's like you actually own the copyright, right? If you have that ape, it's your ape. I don't think that's going to be the normal ownership, right? Um, you know, right now, you know, Marvel's not going to be like, cool, you bought this NFT as Spider-Man, now you own Spider-Man, right? That's just not going to happen. Um, but what it, the way we kind of view ownership, though, is like, if I buy a Spider-Man figurine, right, I didn't buy Spider-Man. But I have a lot of decisions as a consumer. I could put him next to a DC character, you know? I could dress him up like a Barbie doll. I could sell him. I could throw him away. I can. I have consumer behaviors of what do I do with this version of the asset, right? I don't actually own Spider-Man though, right? And I think people are kind of misconstruing that in NFTs. It's really the similar thing, right? It's we're trying to give access to where you can do other things with these assets, right? You have some type of portability. Maybe you have compatibility. Maybe you have a loyalty program and you're being given access into another game. Maybe you have beta access. Maybe you're a tokenized guild leader based on these assets, but it's about providing utility. And the fact that I own that is really kind of a right to transfer or sell or give away or burn or whatever I want, right? So to me, that's a big misnomer in the space when people like true ownership. For us, it's it's ownership to do something with that asset. It doesn't mean that you actually own the copyright necessarily. In some cases you will, some cases you won't. So, yeah. so that's the first thing we got to make sure we, we got to got, got correct with. And I think the industry has to kind of figure that out. Agreed. It, it, the industry as a whole right now has a huge like marketing and messaging issue across the board, right? Because the, the public space has very mixed feelings on all this. Um, you know, and, and, and some of this is complicated even further by the examples of game design that we've, you know, overwhelmingly seen in the past year and a half, which have really been these crazy, like spiky pump and dump style economies. Um, and so, you know, when you consider game design broadly within Web3, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, where you guys sit on this with respect to NFTs, etc. But you know, what what catches your attention? What keeps you up at night around web3 game economy design you know what are you guys trying to get at here yeah so a, a couple things uh, so one you know i think a lot of the mainstream gaming there's been some bad backlash early because they're looking at frankly stuff that we get upset about too right there are a lot of systems that are being set up as a pump and dump right that is what they are right and let's not kid ourselves about what they are um, there's a lot of them that the way they're constructing economies is a ponzi scheme right it's like hey let's hope more money comes in to buy out the old money, right? That is pretty much the definition of that. And I think for us, again, it's it's really, I think the best thing that we would look for is how do you build something with longevity, right? Because time, time and a currency is the same, right? Um, you constantly have to have a demand on a currency to keep keep the value. Time on an asset is very unique, right? And what I mean by that is that, you know, if you have something that's minted, whether it's manufactured in real life or it's manufactured digitally into kind of this form of ownership, if you're actually adhering to, hey, once we stop manufacturing, we will never make that asset again and putting a finite uh, limit on that, time is your friend, right? Because as you bring more people into that ecosystem, they might want to get one of those and they're just not available anymore. And the only way to get them is from another player. So that's going to drive value. Um, of some type, right, in and of itself. Yeah. And I think there's so many instances of that that we see in gaming that will be powerful for these Web3 games. I mean, regionalization. I mean, if you think about like Pokemon Go, uh, that, you know, Niantic bought our last company, so we got, you know, some familiarity with that. But one of the cool things about Pokemon Go is that there's a lot of regionalization, right? If you are uh, out collecting, uh, you know, trying to capture Pokemons in, uh, in Korea, you're probably going to get a, a, a different version, or not a different version, but a, they've kind of segmented it to where there's certain ones that are more prevalent in APAC than Europe, than, than the US, than the Caribbean. That's cool, right? And I think that that you can go all day long in game design to be like, cool, I need to now go work with somebody in the, in the African continent because they might have access to, to content I don't necessarily have as readily available. And to me, that's when it gets exciting, right? When you can suddenly have players are now having to collaborate and do things with other players. Um, and they can actually benefit from that, you're going to let players start becoming entrepreneurial in these games. And that is the turn of when it becomes cool, right? That is such a fun take on it, John. You, you know, I love that because it's it's simultaneously future looking and it's also past looking. You know, it's it's almost a return to the time of, you know, world exploration where you needed to travel across the world to get something, right? Like it, it was different on the other. Now, you know, with the internet and everything, we're very, you know, homogeneous across the whole space. But that's, that's I, I, I love that take. 
and I, honestly, it's maybe it's a personal passion because I'm, I'm very fortunate. I get to travel around the world a lot, you know, with, with this business. And honestly, I, I do miss those days to where it's like you go to a country and you've never seen any of that stuff before. Right. And like, it's all local and, and it's not really now it's kind of Starbucks everywhere, but <laughs> I, I kind of think this is a way to get back to that. Right. And, and I think there is something super powerful around that. Right. So we love concepts like that. We love concepts where you can change the social construct between players, you know, um, to me, it's not, you know, I think there's been some examples, you know, um, like, like the, the axes of the world, you know, the whole gating them, you have to have three assets and those assets cost hundreds of dollars. I, I'm not a, as big of a fan of that. I think games should be free to play mostly, you know, unless you have, yeah. a, you know, it depends on the model, but I think we like making free to play games, but, and, but how do you basically still let people the ha you know, we like to use the phrase, we're not chasing whales, we're creating them, right? And I think that's a big design principle. How do you give opportunities to players that want to be entrepreneurial to become entrepreneurial? I can be the best at this and I could actually benefit, right? And to me, that's the value we're creating. I think any any game that comes out and says, you can make $1,000, every player can make $1,000 a month, um, probably a scam, right? Why? Because that money has to come from somewhere or it's artificially made, right? And if it's artificially made, there's there's a supply that's gonna, you know, supply that's gonna be, in, you know, inflationary or whatever, right? So I think we have to think about, to me, it's really about how do we bring in collabs, right? How do we monetize IP creation within a game um, legitimately, right? How do we have a creator that's like, cool, I created something of value in this game and I'm gonna benefit forever because um, I get a cut of that on every transaction in the future, right? How do we bring in the esports worlds and the influencers and the brands? How do we do that within games, right? And then most importantly, how do we let players have new interactions and new gameplay that by playing the game, they can create something of value? So those so, are the principles we're really thinking about. And we're not thinking about it as much of like, buy this now and it'll be worth 10 times that tomorrow. It's really more like, man, buy it now, have a lot of fun. If you want to be entrepreneurial, maybe there's some opportunities, but there's always kind of a, you know, some type of market for these. So if you get tired of it and you want to get rid of it, great, maybe someone will buy it out, out from you, right? So it's less about like making money. I think there will be a portion of people that can actually make money in the game, right? Because they're being creative and they're selling the value of their IP. But I think other ones, it's just like, it's just a new economy of like, I can, I can do what I want with these assets, you know? Yeah, and it, it, to me, that's what Web three gaming is all about, right? It's we're not exactly. we're not we're not taking Web two gaming and we're not like reinventing the wheel from the start. Web two gaming was great. There was a lot of hits. Like we all had a great time, yeah. right? We just enable people to own the pieces within those economies and see what happens with them. And you know, this kind of this folds into a, a larger discussion around you know player archetypes and you know what kind of players that you see in the ecosystem. And so this is yeah. I I love this question because everyone has their own take. So what I call is I, I kind of divide them into a, a neat dichotomy. It's easiest for me to just keep it like this but i have lumberjacks on one side and gladiators on the other and i call lumberjacks people who are basically like they are opposed to risk right super risk averse they just want to step in chop a little bit of wood maybe sell it maybe engage with the game and step out right then you have gladiators yep. super risk seeking right they step in they want to like actually wager they want to lose something they want to gain something they want to engage um and so you, you know in web3 gaming right now i kind of see it boiling down to those archetypes but there's a ton of others like there's a lot else going on and so what do you see you know what do you guys pay attention yeah, you know that that's that's a great really great point. Uh, one one thing I, I spend a lot of time on, and the question I get asked over and over and over and over is, what, what's what's going on with this metaverse? And I'm like, oh my god, I got to get away from this a little bit. I hate that word, um, God. <laughs> oh, I hate that word. I mean, to me, to me, it, there is a difference though, and I think there's some in the web too. They're like, why why are we what is the metaverse? We've had, we already have open worlds, right? Kind of, they're kind of right, but there is a difference, right? And, and it's that it's that aspect of the player types and what you can do there. And I think the way we kind of view it right now is honestly like to me, metaverses, do you remember sea monkeys? Do you remember yeah. sea monkeys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember sea monkeys, like, yeah. See, and metaverses kind of feel like sea monkeys to me right now. Like you see this box and you're like, oh my God, what are these magical creatures <laughs> with crowns and thrones? I want to be part of that. And then you get into it and it's brine shrimp. You know, you're like, oh man, you know? And I kind of feel we're still a little bit there on some of the metaverses. Like it sounds really cool build it and they will come, but you get into it and it's just kind of like, well, what do I do now, right? And, and the reason for that is I feel like they're not thinking about the user roles, right? So I think we think about the same thing as we think about in terms of kind of explorers, um, builders and owners, right? And owners can be proprietors, mm -hmm. they can be whatever they want to be, right? But some type of, and so we kind of think in most, most games is kind of three roles. And I think metaverses are mostly going to be around those three, but more importantly, how do you balance those three? They have to have some type of relationship and some type of 
need from the others, right? You can't just say, cool, there's three things, go figure it out. I think you have to have some type of architected social structure between people that want to explore and play, but you know, like you're mentioning your lumberjacks, you know, your builders that are like, I'm in it to do something really cool. And a lot of times that's a lot of times that's personal satisfaction too. Right. So we got to keep that in mind. It's not, not everybody's going to build to make money. People are going to build as a creative outlet. Right. But maybe they can make a little bit of money or maybe they start on the creative side and they end up, Hey, I actually have a talent for this. I can actually do something. And then you have kind of the tenants or the owners, right. That are coming in a little bit more speculative, or maybe they're just wanting to represent their own brand or build their own community, right? So these are kind of like the app store leaders, right? And I think these kind of come together and they could be brands, they could be investors, they could be speculators, or they could be players that just like, you know what? I love this game. I want to build a tokenized guild structure on this piece of land and this is what we do it for. So to me, you have to think through that. Every game will be slightly different, but I think you can generalize. We generalize into three. It sounds like you generalize into two, but I think we're all thinking similarly. I love that. Yeah, and it, it really does speak to the importance of a real gameplay with social fabric. And your your mandate as a Web3 developer is, you know, it's slightly different than a Web2 developer because now you have you have these personas that have externalities, right? Like they are interacting with an open market. They are interacting with, you know, other people and trading back and forth. So it's, it's a fascinating discussion. And, you know, one point to kind of put a cherry on the top here of the economy piece, um, you guys notably don't do tokens, right? But a lot of the games right now in the space do these dual token economies and it's a big discussion yep. right is it right is it wrong you know yep. i in my opinion to kind of lead and then you may or may not agree you know i think it's actually impossible to set up a dual token economy and also support nfts i i, I just don't see a way that you can feasibly as we talked about earlier drive cash to all those different entities it's crazy um and so you know I'm, I'm curious to hear you know where you guys shake out on that and you know where you kind of see that unfolding here in the near future yep yeah, that's a great question. So again, we're going deep in NFTs. We think that's where the, the, the real value is going to be. And frankly, honestly, the, when we start talking to game developers, even game developers that are skeptical about it, when you start talking about some of the new stuff you can do with this, it gets really exciting. And I do have one example I want to come back to maybe with a with an idea we did in, in Blanco. It's called Gemrush. I think it's a perfect example of where we kind of draw, drove value um, using NFTs in a game, right? But, but in terms of the tokens and all that, yeah, I think it's very scary, uh, honestly. And I think any developer that starts off saying, hey, we're gonna sell a token, I think that's even scarier, right? Because I think you've already created an unbalanced economy within the game from day one. And, and probably not a sustainable um, token value with it, you know, over time. Like honestly, Stepin's really kind of taken off right now. We'll see, it's, it's, it's going like this still, right? They've gated access, they've created demand, and that's awesome. And if they can keep creating demand for the next 10 years, then yeah, there's gonna be a great value there. If they create demand for three months and it falls off, they could have some challenges too, right? So I think things like that we have to look at. I actually think that a lot of these tokenized uh, currencies in the game are probably be earned, to be real honest it becomes that super ultra rare premium and you have to design it to where yeah we're not selling this right you earn it in the game and but there's there has to be some really really important sinks of what you do with that token right to where you need people that are earning and you're needing people that are maybe building and you need that relationship to be like the builders are dependent on the earners and the earners want to make some money on that right so that's when you create the value it's not just go do a, a token sale for a video game um, that we think, you know, and we think again, buy NFTs, maybe you're rewarded with tokens, you know, and things like that. But I, I think, I think they're dependent, but I think, and we're, we're going to step in, in a small way. Um, it won't be, again, it won't be a token independently listed on Binance, but it'll be some type of token. Maybe you actually can have some type of value against, right? So we're, we're going to play with it a little bit. We're definitely going in on the, the, the NFT side though, because it's just, I mean, there's so many uses, right? Between access and social structures. Oh, and, just a ton you know, of things you can think of. And, you know, valuing IP, right? So I, I, we're definitely going to be heavy on, on the, that NFT side. So. No, and I, I, I like that take for one particular reason, especially, um, you know, this idea of issuing the tokens to your users. So this is a broader topic that we, we won't go into too deeply here, but, you know, you, you do see a lot of people selling tokens and selling off parts of their ecosystem. Um, and to me, the powerful part about Web3 is turning your users into advocates, right? Is like giving them a piece of the ecosystem. And so you want to address that to the people who are actually using it. You don't want to sell it to random third parties who are mercenary. You want 
want to give it to the users. So I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me to, to issue tokens, you know, directly to the to the users if you're going to do it that way. Yeah. Um, kind of the last point around, uh, you know, economies in the space today is this idea of digital land. So digital land is hugely popular for a number of reasons, um, yeah. and there's there's a ton of different ways you can do it, and we've seen a couple different models to date. I'm curious to hear your take. You know, I, I don't know if there's necessarily like a good way to do it or a bad way to do it yet. There's been a lot of experimentation, but I am yeah. curious to see where you sit. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of great stuff that's happening in land. Uh, I think there's, you know, I think again, early days. Um, I mean, I think the best one by far is Sandbox. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of great conversations. That team when Artur, Sebastian, Yasu, I mean, they're, they're great, you know, and they come from the gaming industry. They think through some of this stuff. The thing that's really brilliant that they did, honestly, is they freaking game gamified the land sale, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything's in a one by one. There's a limited demand. If I get a three by three, I get to put my logo on it, right? Like that is a game in and of itself, right? You're now creating this. I need to go find the other adjacent spaces so I get a contiguous piece of land, right? They've done a brilliant job of that. Um, you know, I think some of the prices are kind of crazy still. Like I think land should, you know, these are, these, these should be, hundred dollar two hundred dollar type items not not tens and tens and tens of thousands to start there will be some over time that'll become that but i think for us to hit the mainstream right it's it's a little scary and frankly a lot of the game developers are they don't we don't like having the idea that there's 20, you know items are selling for 40 50 60 thousand dollars a piece right nft worlds and minecraft i think that's one of the reasons that minecraft kind of pulled back on it is they're like wait a second these are like the cheapest one i can buy is fifteen thousand dollars this is free in our game right so so it, it, it's i think you got to really make sure we're thinking about this again in terms of mainstream um so so for us that's the other part i think about land that's hard and really any asset right now um you know we're dealing with an nfl game right now that you know we're working with you know, the mobile platforms we're working with all 32 teams we're working with the nfl league and we're working with the players association right um that's pretty awesome. That's one of the biggest brands in the entire world. It probably has one of the most highest affinity to the consumer market in the entire world. The idea of just saying, hey, cool, we're gonna sell 100 of these, or we're gonna sell 10,000 or 88, 88, or whatever the crypto crowd goes. I mean, like, that just blows my mind, right? Yeah, to there's me, rare three billion, yeah, there's three billion gamers in the world. Like, you just gonna ignore yeah, all of them? Yeah, three billion NFL fans, right? So the idea of like trying to limit something to 88, I mean, honestly, even the teams and stuff are like, why would we do that? You know, like, so, so, to me, we have to change rarity into a relative rarity, not an absolute. And I think that's one of the problems that the crypto industry kind of dug itself into is this whole idea of like, oh, anything over 10,000 is not rare. Well, you're right. If, if you only have a community of 12,000, then anything over 10,000 is not very rare. If you have 10,000 against an audience of 50 million players, then that's stupidly rare, right? And and I think there, there are certain instances you want to do that, right? And the idea of growing that rarity over time is really fascinating to where you are rewarding now the earlier players, right? To where it's like, cool, I got in when 700 was not that rare. Now 700 is excluded, you know, incredibly, incredibly rare. And I was, I was part of that journey, right? And that feels but so good from a user perspective. What's up? It feels so good from a user perspective to do that. It does. You're, 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 you're building community. You're building longevity. And you know what? I guarantee you someone in the future will be, they'll, it'll speak to them, right? Same reason that when we had baseball cards as kids, right? Like I'm from Kansas City. The Kansas City Royals were inherently more valuable to me than they might be from you, right? And, and that's what's amazing about it. And then within a team, a player, maybe it's a position. I played first base. So first baseman were usually like Brett Saberhagen and then groups like that were like, these are like my favorite players, but because I, they, they spoke to me personally, right? So if I was trading cards for you, I would, I would over index on that value to me, right? And then you have things like autographs and you have things like, like little jerseys in them, right? They create value. And then you have like the individual players that just, you know, I love this player and I wanna, I wanna be connected, right? So these are the things we should be thinking about digitally and in our games, right? Rather than like, okay, our collection is gonna be 10,000. It's gonna sell it this way. It's gonna be, we're gonna start at this floor price and it's a floor price game, right? That's, it's just the wrong outlook of where this needs to go. And I think frankly, the quicker we get out of that rut, the more developers you're gonna see. Cause I've talked to some, I've talked, I mean, we've, we've been very fortunate being from the industry. We get those calls, right? We get the CEOs a call saying, you gotta freaking explain this to me because we don't like, we don't, we're not gonna use this tech to build a speculative economy. That's just not interesting to us. And it's not what game developers do, right? Is there partially speculation and everything? That's just how the world works, right? Sure. But if you're building a totally speculative economy, that's not super interesting to the big game developers. And I think these other uses are where 
when you're changing consumer behavior and you're giving new paintbrushes to design new game patterns, that's when it wins, right? And that's when we'll see the entire gaming world will flock to this. It's coming I love up. That. Yeah, no, and you've got to you got to pay attention to the human ethos, and I think you spoke to it there on like people don't want to build crazy speculative environments. It's not what they want. Um, yeah. So yeah, so John, I know we're here at time. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you if there's anything here at the end you want to shout out. Uh, but it has been absolutely a pleasure to have you on. No, thank you so much. Like I said, I think we're we're super proud of the portfolio we're bringing out with Blanco's coming to Epic Game Store. We have you know NFL Rivals is going to be starting up team uh, the, the the rarity rate league pre-sale fairly soon so please join that community we have a racing title nitro nation world tour we are so excited about we have a tcg game we're, we're really kind of doing a lot of fun stuff right now please support us please reach out um we'll go from there i love it guys well if you have not gone and checked out mythical's portfolio yet please do um john it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on thanks a ton thank you so much sam i appreciate it see ya